Welcome to Deep Tech 315. With no further ado, we'll jump into our first topic, which is uh, Google announced a variant to Gemini 2.0 Flash, which we talked about last week, which is this new model. Did more multimodal, more like video uh, and uh, voice and audio capabilities to it. But they came up with a, a thinking version. So the name of this product is... Uh, Gemini 2.0 Flash Thinking. And what's unique about this is it actually does more thinking and reasoning. This is something that Jensen talked about on the NVIDIA earnings call, this kind of a new phase that's emerging around AI, which is these models. Instead of just giving you a quick answer, they're basically continue to ask themselves, uh, basically take your prompt and, and rearrange it in, in, their, in the model's language. And it takes a little bit longer, but uh, presumably is going to give a more robust response and, and thinking. And so this comes out, hits the headlines. Most people don't actually get a chance to uh, use it and play around with it because it's not really available, but Doug Clinton uh, gets his hands on it and you've had some time to play around with uh, the thinking version of Gemini. I have, uh, and they should think about a new name for it because to your point, the thinking name is, is pretty rough. But you can access this right now in Google's AI studio if you wanna play around with it. And uh, what's really cool, I think what's different here with what Google's doing versus what uh, OpenAI did with O1 and the variants that it has of O1 right now is that they actually show you real time the thought process of what the model is asking itself and kind so of- So Google is showing you the thought process where uh, OpenAI open uh, does it. Like if you that. watch you know, your, your model, if you do a query on O1, it might run through like some very specific phrases saying it's thinking about a certain thing, but ultimately it doesn't actually show you the, the thoughtful sort of process it's gone through where Google does. And so it's a very small nuance. I actually think this is probably uh, something that OpenAI will build in its product in the near future. So what does it actually look like when it's thinking? Um, it will show you, you know, just like when you ask a question of any, uh, AI model now, it'll start to, you know, type, you know, and, and text will come down the screen. Basically the thinking version, if you open up the thinking that the Flash 2.0 model is doing, it'll start to show you same thing. What are the questions it's asking itself? And then when it's done thinking, it'll revert to giving you an answer, just like a normal model. Builds confidence, doesn't it? At a minimum? Like in the answer, like yeah, I think that? it does, and and ultimately the proof is in the pudding. I mean, that's that's what matters the most mm -hmm. is are are these thinking processes effective? And so, you know, with intelligent alpha, something we've talked a lot about here, where we're using AI to build stock portfolios, we've been testing some of these uh, thinking or inference time scaling models to see just just how do they look differently? How do they kind of create portfolios mm -hmm. differently? And here's just an interesting statistic, I think. So the Flash 2.0 thinking okay. model, all the same prompts I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you for this data. Okay, I'm taking it thought notes. for seven seconds and output a portfolio. And who knows if that portfolio is gonna be good or not. That's, that's the ultimate test. The O1 mini model thought for 22 seconds before it output a portfolio. The O1 base, model, which is now, I think, widely available to all OpenAI users, GPT users, that fought, thought for four minutes and 23 seconds, so significantly more time than the cutdown models, Flash and, and Mini. And then the uh, O1 Pro model, which is the $200 subscription you know, that, that OpenAI put out recently, that model thought for five minutes and 54 seconds. And what I think is cool about that is you can, you can kind of see that this idea of using inference as an iterative process to improve outputs, it also has a scale factor. You know, for the cheaper models, like a flash, like a mini, you would expect it to think for less time. And, you know, maybe 20 seconds is enough time to get a great answer. And ultimately, the question is going to be, how much better is your answer when a model right. thinks for 20 seconds versus five minutes? Five minutes, yep. Yep. And obviously, there's costs associated with that ongoing thinking. And then you can kind of do a cost breakdown and say, well, is the incremental cost for the additional thought valid to get hopefully a more thoughtful answer? And I mean, we're three days into this, two days into it. There's no way to get a sense about directionally. Do we know is thinking, does it pay off? Thinking longer, I, does it pay I off? I think it depends very highly on the queries that you're using still. 
Um, I would say my, my base answer is right now, it's still, um, to Google's point, I mean, it, it is experimental. I think certain questions will be more useful than other questions. And certain questions we won't be able to answer until we have more data, you know, like if you're testing a portfolio, for example. Do you think um, they'll cut down on uh, hallucinations, the thinking will? Um, it's possible that that could happen over time. I think though that hallucinations largely are gonna be cut down more when you're, when you're probably building the models. I personally, I still think hallucinations are, are not that big of an issue for most use cases. Once you get into the corporate realm, there's other workarounds you can, you can use for that, but I don't think hallucinations are a major issue anyway. Uh, and, and so this, uh, the concept of what, uh, flash thinking is doing eventually that's going to get incorporated in for like a consumer level product it'll just get built into the gemini that you pay 20 bucks a month for correct 100 percent. i mean just like we saw with with open ai i think even the free model i've been a subscriber for so long I, i'm not sure what the free model of chat gpt does now but i'm pretty sure the free model of chat gpt you can use o1 now and o1 the breakthrough with o1 okay. was was this time scaling yeah thinking time We'll jump to our second topic, which is Micron. Uh, this is uh, one that had a rough week from kind of its peak in uh, December 18th to its trough. A day and a half later, it was down 22%. Uh, it has rallied back, call it 5% since then. They had earnings. They guided uh, for the next quarter to be, for revenue to be down 12% versus uh, where the street expectations were. This was largely because of uh, a consumer uh, piece to it. And taking one step back, what Micron does is they make this flash memory. There's two other big players out there, SK Hynix and Samsung, but basically those three uh, provide all the flash memory that we use. And uh, it's a pretty boring business. And it's uh, it really is tied to the boom and bust consumer cycles. And so that lower guidance was related to what they're saying is some slowdown and some PCs and some smartphones with Samsung, and that's having a negative impact on how, how the next quarter is going to look. Uh, the exciting part of their business is high bandwidth memory, this HBM, and it's a relatively small part. They don't break it out, but it's probably about 5% of revenue. It comes in their data center segment, which is up 400%. And so this thing is just, this uh, segment's been on fire. And what this memory does is it's uh, paired with an NVIDIA GPU, for example. And so they go hand in hand for some of these uh, next generation NVIDIA GPUs is high bandwidth memory, and that's more exciting for investors. And so when you put this together, you basically have a business that largely is pretty boring, uh, that is uh, also has one segment that's uh, quite exciting. And I think that the read through on Micron is this is consumer related. And my question is, is do you think that the market is is saying that NVIDIA's woes are a sign that we're at some sort of starting of a break point with a broader AI trade? Or do you think the market's broadly understanding that this is more consumer related and, and don't think of this as any sort of indictment against AI? I would probably lean toward the latter and also add that all of these chip names, uh, or sorry, I should rephrase that, the memory names, I think mm -hmm. historically have been known to have this kind of volatility because supply and demand can change fairly rapidly. In some of it's their, like the nature their, of the beast, this is what you get. Right, you get overbuild, right? You get underbuild. All of a sudden, your pricing's amazing, your margins look great, and then and then it reverts. And so, I think this is just part and parcel of of some of these memory players, um, which are more volatile than I I think generally the overall chip market. And I would, you know, my counter argument I think would be to to your first point, like is is kind of the AI thing over? Is look at Broadcom and the reaction that that stock had a right. week ago. That was really all about excitement from AI. So I don't think the but that's, AI is That's the over AI at all. trade is you just have these big swings and emotion around it that can be day to day. It is. Well, and I think too, when you have a, a stock like Micron, who has a disappointing guide in this case, you're going to have a, a vicious reaction because right. the AI trade, you know, it's, it's going to be volatile by nature. Um, so right. when you have something not working out, you should expect big drawdowns in these names. A couple of specs on Micron. Uh, it currently sits just under $100 billion in market cap. So this is, a, this is a real company and trades at, if you believe the analyst estimates, calendar 26, 
trades at seven times calendar 26 earnings. And when I see that earnings number up about 50% from the expectations from calendar 25 to calendar 26, but when I see that multiple, I just think, what am I missing? Like this shouldn't happen. The old, the old adage usually is when these names trade at seemingly low multiples, the numbers are too high. And when they trade at seemingly high multiples, the numbers are actually too low. And so right. that's, that's the underlying Even question. Even if you is, took that and cut, cut the numbers by 30%, yeah. this is still like as attractive as it reminds me. I mean, not to the same scale, but I remember Meta of a few years ago when it was orbiting around $100 and we were asking ourselves the same question, like, what are we missing here? It kind of feels the same thing with Micron. Yeah, I think the difference is just that the the volatility with uh, as again this segment versus what we're talking right. about with Meta. Meta is right. steady advertising. Well, advertising cost. can be somewhat volatile, but it's not nearly as right. prone to swings as as the memory space. Yeah, that thing to me it feels like a fifteen multiple, but. Uh, feels like there's an opportunity there. Not investment advice, but um, let's jump to our final topic, which is a topic that we don't like talking about, but we have to talk about it this week is uh, the Fed Powell's uh, conversation, his conference call kind of triggered the sell off. Uh, the NASDAQ traded at one point down about 5% on his comments about uh, instead of the expectations of four rate cuts, we go to two and uh, NASDAQ has gained a little bit back here, but from my perspective, it's like this, the market's just uncomfortable about being where it's at and kind of looking for any reason to have a sell-off. That's probably right. And I think just the reality with Fed predicting, I, it's a game that uh, investors, for whatever reason, seem to love to play, but it's inherently unpredictable. You know, I think you have a better chance right. of trying to find companies where you think there is some fundamental reason for why the business could keep going up outside of whatever interest rates do. I mean, interest rates are going to do what interest rates do. If you're a, a macro focused investor, you got to make those predictions. But if you're a stock focused investor, or if you're a technology focused investor, I think it's just really hard to have intelligent predictions about what the Fed may or may do and how the market may or may not yeah. react. I mean, sometimes the market actually reacts inversely to what the Fed messaging can be. You know what I mean? So it's like sometimes, sometimes uh, even if you predict correctly what the Fed might do or say, the direction of the market might go uh, the inverse way that you think it might. You know, we should ask Intelligent Alpha what it thinks about, uh, even though it's outside of the wheelhouse of picking companies for, uh, be curious what its perspective on what the Fed's going to do kind of going forward. The Fed has been emphatic. This is data driven. Any any, and, and I think the reality is it's unpredictable. They don't even know what they're going to do, but I would just put, I'll uh, bring everything to kind of a, a core focus at Deepwater. How we think about these is that uh, whether there's one, two, three uh, rate cuts in 2025, it uh, doesn't really significantly change. It does not significantly change the A topic, which is how is AI ultimately going to be uh, translating to higher earnings, higher revenue growth for these companies. And so, from our perspective, we're just we just ride that wave, and and the next data points, uh, it's gonna, there's a piece of patience here. We're going to get some more inflation numbers kind of coming out early in January, around the 15th is the next uh, I think uh, the next CP number, and then it won't be till end of January till we hear from the big tech companies again. Nvidia is going to be after that, so we're going to have a little bit of lull here where we get probably some earnings or data points, and so. Patience is going to be a virtue. We still are on board with the AI train. I'm going to leave it add, at that. Yeah, let, me, let me add two things in just real quick uh, that I think are important. One is think about the AI trade often compared to the internet era. During the internet era, 93 to 2000, interest rates generally were between 4 and 7%. And that's so, amazing. So I think that's important to remember when we talk about you know the market versus the AI trade and then what is the Fed do right whatever it does how much does it matter just remember the internet boom happened when rates were you know higher actually for most of that cycle than they are right now so i don't think the ai boom just to be clear is dependent on the fed continuing to cut rates i think it can happen without that amazing uh want to wish everyone a happy holidays and uh we'll catch you next time on deep tech bye for now